Okay, well, welcome back, guys. I'm going to have a short, a small class today. <laughs> All right. Um, any questions you may have? I've not completed grading my part of the exam. I will here by this weekend get everything up to date. But um, um, oh, one moment. Okay, so I did get my pen straightened up, so hopefully I can uh, be more descriptive in what we were trying to talk about. So if there's been no, question, no questions, I will continue. We ended up on, on slide 22, and we had just started to do uh, Lewis dot structures for polyatomic ions, okay? Now, the process that we, we've done for the neutral ions meaning those compounds that had no charge in them, is that um, it's the same process. The only difference here is that these are ions and therefore, therefore depending on the ion, you're either gonna subtract or add from the total valence electrons that you utilize. Now, someone asked me the question said, well, aren't we adding electrons? And, and the question and the answer to that, it, no, we're really not because most of these ions come from neutral species, okay? And so, for example, this, this first one up here, BrO3, they may have been hydrogen attached to that in the beginning, and that hydrogen was removed. And when that happens, that hydrogen, uh, it goes away with a positive charge and leaving that lone pair, that pair that was bonded to the hydrogen is placed on one of the uh, one of the uh, um, oxygens. So in effect, we're taking into account of what it, these ions were uh, valence shell wise uh, when they were neutral and we have to account for that. Uh, for the positive cations, it's the same scenario. You know, what happens is a proton or a hydrogen with a plus sign comes in and attacks or attaches itself to a neutral species <clears throat> and then creates a, a, a cation. I'll, get, I'll, I'll give an example here in a bit. So let's go back and start off uh, with BrO3 minus, okay? We do the valence shell count like we normally did, the bromine, <clears throat> in this case bromine, I call it bromine because bromine is the central atom. If it was not the central atom, then it would be called bromide, okay? It's central because it's underscored in that it signifies to you that bromine is the central atom and everything else is bonded to that. So it brings in seven, seven uh, el valence electrons. There's three oxygens that bring in <clears throat> six apiece because in group, it's there, they are in group six. That's a total of 18. And then we need to add one because of the charge of the anion, okay? So tally it, it up, we end up with a total of 26 valence electrons or uh, a total of 13 pair. Now, given the formula here, okay, given that bromide is a central, atom, we can quickly put bromide, write it down. And then there are three oxygens bonded to that. So we can draw, quickly draw a line and attach those three oxygens onto the central atom. Well, that takes care of three pair. So we had 13 that we calculated. We take off three because that's what we had to work with given the formula. So we have a total of 10 valence electron pairs left over, okay? And I stated, for me, I like to go around the outside atoms and then work my way in. So I'm gonna just, I got 10 to work with. So I'm just gonna go starting with the oxygens and add 10 pair, okay? Now, I go one, two, and three. Now I can't add any more around this particular oxygen, right? Because there are already four pair around it. The octet is fulfilled. So I move on to the next oxygen. Okay, so that's three pair. Three, 
four, five, and six. Again, this oxygen now has eight electrons around, around it. And then we continue to the next one out of six, and we got seven, eight, and nine. Okay, so that took care of nine. So we got one pair left to work with. And that's my, my inventory. I got to keep track of that. I got one left. I cannot put them on the oxygens because the odd tech is, is full. Okay, there's one, two, three, four pair around each oxygen, two per line. So it's a total of eight. The bromine only has one two and three. So there's only six around it. So we have no choice, obviously, to put that lone number, number one pair left on the central atom. So we have zero pair to work with. Okay. And so now we go back and double check. Let me clear this up a little bit, get a little messy there. And so we had the, uh, we had the, the bromine. One, two, three, and oh. <laughs> I carried away there with my, my lines. PR, one, two, and three, my oxygens. Okay. One, two, and three in each one. One, two, three in each one. One, two, three in each one. Then the last one there. Go back before you go any further and double check to make sure you got 13 pair from your calculation. And, and we do, okay? We got nine, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, nine lone pair around each oxygen. So that's, and then that's 10, 11, 12, 13. So we're good to go, okay? Now, since this is an ion, we put the bracket around it, and then we put the charge in the upper right corner, which is a negative, okay? And that is the lowest dot structure for this particular ion. Now, can we, calc can we determine the general formula of A, B, E? Yes, we can, no different from the neutral species. So we have A, we got B3, because it's got three oxygens around it. I'll change the color here to make sure you see what I'm talking about. So I got one, two, and three. So that's B3. And then we got a lone pair on the bromine. And so we end up with the E, okay? So with this general formula, we then can take it to the shapes table. There we go. And look for AB3, and there it is right there, AB3. There's a geometry, a model of it, and that geometry has a specific name, trigonal pyramid, and that bond angle is less than 109.5. Okay. All right. And that's what we come up with. Okay. Now, the next one, SO4 might negative two. That's a sulfate ion. If you look at the polyatomic ion table, you'll find that SO4 negative two charge uh, called the sulfate ion. Sulfur brings in six, oxygen total 24, okay? There's four oxygens here. And then a negative two we add because of the negative charge of the iron. So that gives us a grand total of 32 electrons, okay? Or 16 pair. We're given that the sulfur is a central atom and there are four oxygens bonded around the central atom. So we can quickly write uh, four bonds and place the oxygens on here. Okay, so that took care of four pairs. So we got 12 pair left to work with. Now, it may, this may sound redundant, but then I, and I do that on purpose because it's important to keep track of your, of your inventory, what you calculate. Because again, you don't wanna add too many nor do you want to subtract in a really subtracted or in, or you may have the right calculation, but in the process of writing the formula, you may lose a, or add a lone pair. Okay. So we double check everything at every step. So that took care of four pair. Okay. So we, uh, 
oh, excuse me. <laughs> See what I'm saying? That went too far. I already to, uh, counted for the four pair. Are we going to do it again? Okay. So now this 12 pair, as always, I go around the outside atoms and I go one, two, three, four, five, and six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Okay. And obviously, I didn't, I stopped at four pair because the octet has been fulfilled. And sulfur has four around it, and everybody's happy. I still have a total of 16 pair. This is an ion, so I put the bracket and the negative two charge in the top right corner. So that is the Lewis dot structure for this particular polyatomic ion. General formula, we do the same thing. We got A, B, and there's four items of our elements or atoms bonded around the sulfur. So we got AB4. And then if you go to the shapes table, AB4 would be tetrahedral with the bond angle of 109.5. Okay. So there it is right there. Um, and the next one, cyanide, is a negative charge. So we had four for the carbon, uh, five from nitrogen, and uh, one add one for the electron. And we do that simply. We end up with that. Okay. Now notice, notice if you would have inadvertently forgot to add that one you would end up with nine, okay? And let's say, for example, which nine, I told you, is, is not divisible by, by two. You always will get a number divisible by two. But let's say instead of adding one, you subtract it, and you end up with uh, eight valence electrons or four pair, okay? See what I'm saying? Instead of instead of adding, you inadvertently subtracted one, and that gave you eight. Nine minus one is eight. Eight valence electrons is four pair, okay? Well, that means that one of these in here, you'll be short, because one, two, three, four, and that wouldn't work. That's a flag for you to tell you, hmm, something's not right here. You know, I can't, I can't make a, a four bonds. Okay, there's no such animal as far as we know. It's only single, double, or triple. And so the fact here that instead of adding, you subtracted, you results in not enough electrons. And the, the converse of that is if you go the other direction you end up with more electrons than you, you can put anywhere. Why? Remember, maintain the octet. Because I see a lot of this sometimes. And ask yourself the question, that, that doesn't make sense. Let me, let me clear this up a little bit. OK, so we can see. For example, uh, this one here, I've seen things like okay, and, and let's just say they had this correctly. Now, for some reason, they end up with an extra electrons and they figure, well, I got the octet and the oxygen, but the only place I can go in is in the sulfur, right? Well, at, at first glance, that seems a logical place for it to be. However, count the, the lone pair, count the electrons around sulfur. We got one, two, three, four, five pair. We got 10 electrons in this configuration, okay? So that, again, we're saying, whoa, it's a flag. Something's not right. My, my accounting uh, may be in there. I may have, and it happens to, you You take an element in group six and maybe you, you, you put seven down or five. Okay, so double check, making sure to make sure that you collect, you've got the correct, correct uh, number of valence electrons. And also when it's an ion, double check to make sure that you, 
added to the, added to the valence electron count when it's an anion negative charge and subtract it when it was a positive ch charge ion. Okay. All right. Which brings us to this, which is basically a topic that I've been introducing and telling you that remember, keep in mind that um, electrons are negative charge. And so if, if I have a lone pair of electrons someplace, I think of these, my, my pen, my comb here is lone, lone pair of electrons. So they're gonna repel each other, okay? And by repelling each other, they're gonna affect the rest of the molecule. As compared to, let's say it was bonded, then, then the repulsion would be against another bonded pair. And so that effect, because the charge of electrons and the repulsion has a big effect on the structure of the overall compound. And hence, they come up with this model, valence shell electron pair repulsion model, or AKA VSEPR, okay? So, the compares repel each other and they want to move away from each other as far as they can as possible. Okay, because like charges repel. So, things like, you know, I've already introduced to you the ABE general formula equation that we utilize to determine the shape, where A represents the center atom, B are all the outer atoms that are bonded to the central atom, and E are the lone pairs on the central atom. That's important, E, lone pair on the central atom. We don't care about what's happening as far as lone pairs on what's bonded to the central atom, okay, just on the central atom. Now, when there's only two atoms, like, for example, all the diatomics, hydrogen, you know, oxygen, etc., uh, the molecule just by default has to be linear, this particular molecular shape, okay? And there's a Lewis dot structure for uh, chlorine. Now, when they had the general formula of AB2, we did carbon dioxide here, and that's the Lewis dot structure that you calculate. It also is linear, okay? By default, because the double bond by default makes it linear. It is forced to be linear in this position. The, the black represents carbon and the two reds represent oxygen. Now you may have, it was called a, a, the AB3 rep, is rep, represented by the name of trigonal planar. So if you were to you know, look at from the top, that structure of what you see there, that is uh, 120 degrees all the way around, okay? So it's 120, 120 degrees. Change the color here. Now this compound, you may be familiar with, that is the structure for what we call formaldehyde. If you ever um, dissected animals in high school, I don't know if they do that as much now, but they restore the animals in formaldehyde but you got to be careful because it's been shown that formaldehyde can cause cancer. So in long-term exposure. Okay, the tetrahedral. Here's a model of a tetrahedral. This is the most common type of configuration that compounds have out there. You can see the three-dimensional model here. At bond angle is our standard 109.5, okay? Again, these are electrons in here, eight pair, and they are repelling each other. And that is the configuration where they have the maximum repulsion and, and stable in that position. It does not mean that these guys don't occasionally bend, and they do. We have an, an, a uh, spectroscopic method that looks at that bending aspect. There's also a stretching aspect, and then there's asymmetrical bending and symmetrical bending, quite, quite extensive. Okay. Here's an interesting one with the AB2E, okay? This one's sulfur dioxide. Now, when we end up uh, doing the electron configuration for the species, we end up with a lone pair on the central atom. 
Okay, so it's general form is A, B, 2, E. With that lone pair, automatically we have eight what we call polar species, okay? So once we, you determine the Lewis type structure and you end up with a lone pair of electrons in the center of atom, automatically think polar compound, okay? Now, because those two electrons that are on the lone pair and the unbonded pair are repelling each other, that causes this angle here to be much less than what we would think to be 120 degrees. And it's simply because of the lone pair sitting here, okay? Unlike we did the trigonal uh, planar here, 120 degrees, okay? All the way around, 120 all the way around. Over here, nope, that, that angle gets dropped because of the lone pair, which causes, uh, uh, has an effect, I should say, on the properties of, of the molecule which we're gonna learn about here in a bit. Now the AB3, AB3E, the other AKA known, known as the trigonal pyramid. Okay, a good example of this, this is ammonia. We got a lone pair on the central atom. And as the same reasoning I talked about earlier, this lone pair takes a lot of space. So this bond angle gets pushed in. And so that results in a bond angle, that, again, that is less than what we would think, expect to be of 109.5, okay? Because those electrons, lone pair of electrons are uh, repelling and taking up more space. And there's a general formula sitting right there of what it looks like, at least our models. Uh, an interesting one, which is water. Water has a general formula of AB2E2, telling tell us that there are two lone pair, two lone pair of electrons on the central atom and two bonded pair, okay? And that bond angle, again, this bond angle right here is much less, much less than our standard 109.5. Because again, I repeat, these two lone pairs now take up even more space. There's four electrons in there repelling each other. So it's really forcing that bond angle to, to squeeze down. All right, so given this information, um, given a compound, a covalent compound or molecule, or a polyatomic ion, you know, be able to draw the Lewis dot structure simply by adding up the valence electrons that we just talked about. you will be told who is the central atom and then bond all of this, whatever's bonded, whatever's given to you, bond into the central atom. Make sure everybody has an octet, okay? And if you don't have enough electrons, given the valence electron count that you come up with, create single bonds or I mean, create double bonds and, and or triple bonds as needed because somebody's going to have an excess electrons that they can share with someone else. Okay. And then with that information, once you got the general structure, you can now create the general formula, which then you use a shapes table to determine the shape and the bond angle. All right. And you might want to try this at home, give you something interesting to work with. This, by the way, O3, that, that is the symbol of the formula for ozone. And so, you know, you can, uh, the central atom is one, one of those oxygens. So I'll give you a hint, it's, it's like this. I'll give you a start and you do the rest, okay? So there's one of these oxygens in the middle and those two other ones are bonded to it, okay? So try that. I'll give you another hint about the pH3, very similar to, species we just did, ammonia, NH3. Why? Because they're in the same group, same number of valence electrons. All right, so give those a shot. And then if, you, if you're able to figure it out, not figure out, just let me know. And we'll bring it back to class and we'll work it. Okay, wow. How's this tied in together? This is part of it. This is 
what we call bond polarity, okay? Now, what do we mean by polarity? There's a number of things around us that, that are polar. Even people can be polar, okay? Bipolar, for example, meaning two poles. Um, you have batteries that have two poles. You have a positive and a negative. The earth is has a pole. We got the North Pole and the South Pole, okay? Now, when in a covalent bond, covalent meaning that these valence electrons are being shared between two atoms, when the electrons are shared equally, that bond is called a nonpolar bond because there's an equal sharing. And the best example in the general terms is when let's say A is bonded to A, okay? So we got a tug of war here for this bond. But the thing is that A and A are both the same uh, element, same size, same characteristics and so forth. Remember when we talked about electronegativity, okay? Electronegativity was a measure of the affinity of a bonded atom to pull electrons onto itself. So in this scenario, A and A are the same. They have the same electro, uh, EN, electronegativity. So there's an equal sharing. See how that goes? There's an equal sharing, there's no pole. We call that a non-polar bond. That non-polar bond, which is important to recognize because that non-polar bond is gonna tell us some information of the property of the whole chemical. And some examples of species out here that are nonpolar bonds would be, let's say, any oil like, any oil, either be it vegetable oil or be it uh, motor oil. These are very are nonpolar bonds and not soluble in water because water has very polar bonds. Okay. And therefore, the polar and the nonpolar do not mix. Like dissolves like. Water substances, material, water like material will dissolve in water. Oil like material will dissolve in oil. Those two will not mix together. And so when we look at a polar bond, think of two atoms that are the same and it's a tug of war and it's two 200 pounders pulling on that rope and it's equal amount. No, there's no winner. There's not one having a, an advantage over the other. Okay, when there is a bond between two different elements, like in general terms, A and B, okay, automatically the fact that they're different tells you that they have different electronegativity values. There's only one exception, and I commit this to memory. The only one exception is when you see a carbon hydrogen bond that the electronegativity, the electronegativity of carbon and hydrogen are essentially the same. Therefore, the electronegativity of a carbon hydrogen bond is they're the same. Therefore, it is a nonpolar species. Carbon hydrogen bonds is what makes up a lot of vegetable oils, a lot of hydrocarbons that bring your fuel and so on and so forth, okay? The electronegativity is the same, so therefore they act as a nonpolar bond. When they are different, you create a polar bond, and that's represented by A and B to show you got two different letters, okay? And look at it that way. If I have a bond between two different species, I have a polar bond. So for example, if I have a bond between carbon and carbon, nonpolar. Why? They're both the same element. If I have a bond between carbon and hydrogen, even though they're different, it's nonpolar because the electronegativity of carbon and hydrogen is essentially the same. But if I have a, carbon, a bond between carbon and nitrogen, we have a polar bond because the electronegativity of carbon and nitrogen are different. And one of these species is gonna pull the electrons onto itself more so the, uh, than the other element. So now we have a tug of war between a 200 pounder and a 400 pounder. 
guess who's going to win, right? The 400 pounder just by virtue of the weight. That's one way to look at this bond polarity business. Now the question is, well, who is pulling more than the other, okay? Remember when we talked about EN, we looked at the periodic table and we said the most, the most electronegative element on the periodic table was fluorine. And to use that as a benchmark to determine between anything other than fluorine, like a carbon nitrogen bond, as to who is more electronegative. And the trend was from left to right, the electronegativity goes up. So here, if we look at carbon, carbon, so I would say about here, nitrogen's about here, right? So nitrogen is closer to fluorine, which tells you now that fluorine is a lot more electronegative. You don't have to, every element on the product table has an electronegative value. It's not necessary to memorize all those values. That's 100 plus values to memorize. All you got to remember is where their position is relative to, to fluorine. And the one that's closest to fluorine would, will have a, will pull the electrons. So the result is we have a polar bond here. And the result is on one side, we're going to have what we call a partial negative and a partial positive, but more on that in, in a second. Okay. So that's, this is crucial because this goes on down the road. Again, it, polarity keeps popping up. Okay. Uh, electronegativity again is the uh, ability of a bonded atom to attract the electrons in, in, in a bond onto itself. Elements that are less electronegative are further away from fluorine. Fluorine is a most electric element on the periodic table. Okay. Noble gases obviously wouldn't even play a factor here because they don't react. They already, their octet is fulfilled. So there's no electronegativity, they have EN of zero. And here's the trend to refresh your memory with fluoride, fluorine being in the upper right corner somewhere right here. Okay. That's our benchmark. All right, so some examples of nonpolar covalent bonds. All of the diatomic compounds have no fear of ice cold beverage. Remember those? Seven of them are nonpolar species compounds, nonpolar bonds. Okay, because we're going to learn, we have to first identify the bonds to see if they're polar or nonpolar. We're going to take that information. That information is going to affect the overall polarity. Okay, so if I think of it this way, if my arm is a bond, both my arms are a bond, the type of bond in each arm is going to affect the overall polarity of, of myself as a molecule. And so I may end up with a polar bond, a polar bond, but it's still be nonpolar. In general, if your molecule is made up of nothing but nonpolar bonds, your, your molecule will end up as a nonpolar species. That's, that's in general number one. Number two, which really has two subsets, is this. If there are polar bonds in your molecule and they do not cancel out, I'll explain that in a second, they don't cancel out each other, then you have a polar species. If you have polar bonds in your molecule and they tend to cancel out, depending on their configuration, which is related to the electron dot structure, see how it's tied in? Then if they cancel out, you have a nonpolar species, even though you have polar bonds, okay? You can't generalize and say, well, they got polar bonds, then it's a polar molecule. You gotta go one more step, one more question to ask, how do they cancel each other out? That's compared to nonpolar, all nonpolar bonds automatically, nonpolar molecule. So all the diatomics are uh, nonpolar. And as I explained earlier, even those are the carbon hydrogen bond. That carbon hydrogen bond is essentially a nonpolar bond simply because 
the electronegativity of carbon and the electronegativity of hydrogen are essentially the same. So the net is, is basically zero, okay? And it's considered that carbon hydrogen bond is considered a nonpolar bond. Okay, polar covalent bonds. Now, so, oh, before I forget, you know, right now we're talking about covalent compounds. That's where you actually have a bond and you're sharing of a electrons, you're either sharing equally or non equally. Ionic compounds, there's no sharing. I have a full negative charge and a full positive charge, and they come together like two magnets coming together. That's it. Okay. Covalent bonds, different ball game. You're going to either have one of the two, either a nonpolar bond or a polar bond, and that's related to the electronegativity of the elements in charge. All right. So things like carbon, hydrogen, okay, hydrogen and chloride, sulfur and fluoride. Silicon and nitrogen all have polar covalent bonds. Again, because there's a difference in electronegativity between those two atoms, because they're different. Okay, just the fact that they're different, you got a polar bond because they differ different. They differ in polarity, in electronegativity. And we can determine who's going to pull more because of their position relative to fluorine. Okay. And so this is what happens. With respect to ionic compounds, you have a full negative, full positive charge. Not so with covalent bonds. Because of the difference of electronegativity, you have a partial, partial charge. And they are denoted by the following symbols. These symbols here represent a partial positive, meaning that if I have a pole, like a battery, think of it as a battery, you have a positive side and a negative side. Well, if there's a difference in electronegativity where one is pulling, let's, let me give you an example. Well, we got one right here. We have a carbon fluoride bond right here. We know that fluoride automatically is the most electronegative element out there. So automatically, it's going to pull the electrons onto itself much more readily than carbon. So it kind of forces a, 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 a charge here. When we had, let's say, fluorine equal pulling, the electron density around that molecule is fairly uniform. Kind of, I'm trying to denote as this oval. But if I put carbon and fluoride, because the fluoride is pulling that electron density more so to itself, that electron density is now more concentrated around the fluoride. So it's kind of skewed, okay? And so we can put on the fluoride a partial negative symbol, that there is a partial negative charge on the fluoride because it's pulling the electrons toward itself. The result is the electron density around the carbon has been diminished. And by putting less in electron uh, uh, property to the carbon, it creates a positive side. And therefore, the carbon is, no, deno is denoted by a partial positive side. We also have a, a dipole arrow, uh, arrow where the arrow it points to the most electronegative air, uh, a, a, uh, atom. And then we put a little plus charge on the other end of the arrow to denote the partial positive side. Okay. And so we look at oxygen. Oxygen is by far much more electronegative than hydrogen. Again, based on their position uh, on the product table. Hydrogen's way in the far left and oxygen's pretty much closer to fluoride. Yeah. Uh, do we have to think about it for the first example? No, because fluoride is the most electronegative. We just, it's an automatic thing that it's gonna have the partial negative. 
That tells me here that oxygen has a partial negative and results in hydrogen having a partial positive. And so we draw the arrow from right to left, okay? Here we have a phosphorus and a chloride bond. Well, again, looking at the electronegativity relative to, on the periodic table, we see that the chloride is a lot more electronegative than the phosphorus simply because it's closer to fluorine. So the chloride exhibits the partial negative and the phosphorus has the partial positive and therefore our dipole error goes from left to right, okay? Left to right. Remember when I gave you that general formula A, B? Notice everybody here, two different elements automatically polar species, okay? Unless it's carbon hydrogen. That's the only uh, rule, uh, the only two different elements that would be nonpolar. Once you know that two different elements, it's polar, to determine which direction the arrow goes with the arrow pointing to the most electronegative element, you find its position, both of their positions relative to fluorine, whoever's closer, is the most electronegative, okay? You don't have to memorize any absolute values. You can if you want, but totally up to you. We don't present any absolute values. You can look, you can Google and they'll give them to you. Okay, we know about uh, noble gases and noble gases don't really react again because you got the octet and we'll just leave it at that at least for the CHEM 130 level, okay? Now, here, we're gonna add the delta notation, which is the partial notation, and the polarity error of these compounds, okay? Now, what we do first, first of you can notice here that carbon oxygen, two different elements, okay? Now, the question is in which direction? So, we know we got a polar bond here, polar bond here, polar bond here, polar bond here, right? Two different atoms bonded together. But we do not have a polar bond here because hydrogen and, chloride and, and copper, excuse me, carbon exhibit very similar electronegativity values. All right, now the question is in which direction? Once you determine the, that they're polar, you find their relative position, so the carbon oxygen, where is oxygen relative to carbon? We do that too by the periodic table. Second. And we see we got carbon right here, excuse me, oxygen right here, carbon right here. Oxygen is much closer to, to fluoride, fluorine here. Therefore, this has, oxygen has a higher electronegativity. Therefore, oxygen would have the partial negative on it and the partial positive on the carbon. And the arrow goes from left to right. Okay. Uh, nitrogen and fluoride, no question here. Fluoride's the most electronegative. You don't have to look that up in the, on the product table. And our arrow goes from left to right here in this scenario. Oxygen, as we did earlier, is a lot more electronegative than hydrogen. And so it has a partial positive. Hydrogen has, excuse me, a partial negative and hydrogen has a partial positive. Our arrow goes from right to left. You know, sometimes the way they write this, the arrow goes right to left or left to right. If they would have written in this direction, Guess what? It goes from that direction, okay? So be aware <laughs> how they wrote that. Carbon and chloride, okay? Find it in the product table. Chloride's a lot more electronegative than carbon based on their position. And therefore we had the arrow going from right to left. And CH, we know there's no dipole here. So therefore there's no uh, notation to right because it's not polar. Okay, there you go. Now, four polar compounds, um, these are what we call permanent dipoles, 
permanent because the nature of the beast with respect to the two elements that got together to form a bond, they are what they are and they innately just bring to the table a polar bond, okay? Now, um, the nonpolar bonds can create temporary, temporarily a dipole, okay? We'll talk about that in a second, but they can. But very weak, but it can. All right. Are the bonds ionic, polar covalent, or nonpolar? Typical type of question. Okay. And so we take a look and we see we got a we got the bromine, bromine. Well, obviously, two nonmetals. Okay. So that's a covalent bond. So the next question, once we determine it's covalent, is it polar or nonpolar? Well, we got two atoms of the same. So we have a nonpolar bond, NP, okay? Phosphorus and fluoride, it's a covalent bond, okay? Question is, is, is it uh, polar or nonpolar? Well, the fact that you got fluorine, excuse me, phosphorus and fluoride, no question about it, two different elements we have a polar bond. Sodium chloride has nothing to do with this type of bond polarity. It is ionic and in itself because the soluble water is considered to be polar. Okay, so this is ionic bond, that's it. Okay, and then we have the fluoride and the bromide. You would think, well, two, two of these coming together, two halogens coming together, we would have a nonpolar species, but it doesn't. The bond, again, uh, fluoride is a lot more electronegative than bromide. Therefore, there's gonna be a polar bond associated here. Unlike the fluoride fluoride, where they're both the same, and we end up with an MP bond. Over here, two different elements, polar bond, okay? And so we got nonpolar, polar, ionic, and polar, respectively. Okay, now if we needed to write the dipole arrow and the delta notation, well, obviously none here because it's nonpolar. Over here, fluoride again is the most polar species. So there's a partial negative on the fluoride, partial positive on the phosphorus. This, this uh, is ionic, wouldn't pertain to the, uh, the uh, uh, delta notation or the bond, polarity of the bond. Okay. Remember, they, they put a bond here, it, but it's not really a bond. It's an attraction like two magnets, but it's the nature of the beast is uh, the world has decided to call that a bond. <laughs> okay, here we have a polar bond and partial negative on fluoride because a lot more electronegative. So it does put a partial positive on the bromide. Okay. Now, any questions so far, feel free to, to jump in. Okay. Now, with respect to polarity, it's a, a very important concept. Okay. And so, it, it, you need need to grasp grasp this because that this will be a come in time and time and time again. Okay, think of it as a tug of war between the electrons. When that tug of war is even, evenly the elements are the same. That tug of war is even. If they're not, because one of one of them is more electronegative, one of them is going to be winning the tug of war. It's not going to win it completely but it's gonna be pulling more electrons onto itself than the other, resulting in a partial negative on that element, resulting in a delta negative, and the arrow would be pointed to that most electronegative element, okay? All right, so, um, what do we got here? All right, S similar question as before, they asked you, is this ionic? Is it polar or nonpolar? Well, sodium chloride, metal, non-metal, this guy is ionic. We don't have to go any further, okay? Uh, HCl, two, two non-polar species, okay? 
two nonpolar, uh, let me restate that, two nonmetals, <laughs> hydrogen and the chloride, results in a covalent bond. So we know that. Now, next determine that two different elements, hydrogen and chloride, therefore I result in a polar covalent bond. Hydrogen and hydrogen, both the same electron activity, they're diatomic hydrogen. Guess what? It's a nonpolar covalent bond. Chlorine and carbon, two different elements, two nonmetals, a covalent bond. And since they're too different, automatically think of it as a polar covalent. Carbon hydrogen, as we stated, think of it as like the diatomics that are going to be nonpolar because the electron activity of the two is, is very similar. Oxygen and oxygen, again, a nonpolar covalent bond. Uh, potassium and oxygen, obviously, that is ionic because the combination of a metal and a nonmetal. And then phosphorus and fluoride, again, we have two nonmetals, covalent bond, two different uh, uh, atoms in the bond, so we have an ionic bond. Excuse me, a polar covalent bond. I was staring at ionic <laughs> slip of the mouth there. Okay. Any questions? All right. Now, we've been talking about the bond itself. Okay. And um, now we're going to determine what's the overall effect on the full molecule based on the bonds within the molecule. Okay. As I stated before, I said, when, all, when you identify the, the, molecule, the, the bonds in that molecule and they, all of them are nonpolar, then you have what's called a nonpolar molecule. Nonpolar bonds produce a nonpolar molecule. Okay. If you have a polar bond and they don't cancel out, then you have a polar molecule. Now, what does that mean? Let me explain this. You see here, sulfur dioxide, okay? Um, there's a, a arrow on both of these bonds. On the right side, the arrow, because it's a polar bond, is pointed down to the far bottom right direction. The other one is going in the opposite direction. Okay, now the reason behind that is because recall that, that when we do the valence structure for this species, we end up with a lone pair in the central atom, which causes the bond angle to shrink less than 120. Okay, you may be say, you might say, well, how come it's not like this, where you have these oxygens, you know, going in opposite directions. Well, we, it, it's not that because again, that lone pair forces that bond angle to shrink. So you end up with that structure, okay? The, those dipole arrows, let me briefly explain by what I mean by canceling. We can treat those arrows as, as, as a what we call vector. I don't want to get too much, much into the mathematics, but a vector. Now, what exactly is a vector? Well, a vector is a quantity, a mathematical quantity that has magnitude and direction. If I say to you, okay, north, why well, everybody knows where north is, but if I say five miles north, that gives you more information, right? If I go five miles north or five miles south or southeast or whichever direction, as long as I have direction and magnitude, that is what's considered a vector. Now, because of that property, when vectors are added together, we can, we can graphically add vectors together. So if this had four units and this was four units, and they're going in the same direction Well, the total vector is eight units, okay? Because they're going in the positive direction. If they were going in, both going in the negative direction, because we have to, we have to designate as negative, negative four, negative four, well, both of them have a negative eight units of units, right? 
Now, what happens is this. If one of them is going in the negative forward direction and the other one is going in the positive forward direction, guess what happens? The net is equal to zero because the, the left vector cancels out the right vector They're completely opposite of each other. In this example of sulfur dioxide, that's not the case. They don't cancel each other out, okay? They're going in southwest, if you will, and the other one's southeast, and they're going different direction, even though they had the same magnitude, the, you can add these things together and you end up with a, with a net value. When I add them up in the example I showed earlier, I end up with a net value of zero, okay? All right. So this is what I mean. If you have polar bonds and you can see that we've got a sulfur and an oxygen, I got a polar bond, no question. A polar bond in the right, polar bond in the left side, okay? No question about polarity of the bond. And the molecule itself is polar because the polar bonds do not cancel each other out. And that, that is why using losing, using the uh, or making the Lewis dot structure is very helpful in determining the overall polarity of the molecule. Okay. Now, if we look at carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide exhibits two polar bonds in bonds in, in two directions. We got this one from carbon to oxygen going to the right, and this one from carbon to oxygen oxygen going to the left. Okay, and so left, the magnitude will be in the negative position, it's just like a, a graph. You know, you got a graph, this is my zero point. Going up over here, the, the Y is positive, right? And the X is positive. If I go down here, down in this direction, the X is negative and I'm going still going to the right, it's still positive. And if I go to the left, I'm going to the negative direction, okay? So those vectors, those lines, follow the coordinate system of any graph. And so the one in the left is going in the negative direction and the right, the one in the right is going in the positive direction. The fact that they're both carbon oxygen bonds tells you they have the same magnitude. If this were this species, like that, Yes, they have both vectors, but I mean, both, you know, they both have a dipole bond, but they're going to have a different, this would be, this one would be a polar because the sulfur is a lot, a little more, uh, the magnitude over here is a little bit different than the magnitude on the left, okay? So these, these would not cancel out but these do, resulting in a nonpolar molecule. And th this part's important. So we, we use Lewis dot structures to, uh, to determine the configuration, the geometry of the molecule, okay? From that, we identify which bonds are polar. And from the geometry, given that how their shape is, and from the shapes table, it allows us to determine if polar bonds, if it has any, cancel out or not cancel out. And that tells us if the molecule is overall polar or nonpolar, which then we're going to utilize to talk about properties of that molecule, okay? All right. Yeah, we did uh, carbon monoxide, excuse me, <laughs> carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and CH4 is methane, tetrahedron, and uh, CO2 is, uh, is linear, and uh, because of the configuration is now poor, okay? The fact that carbon hydrogen simply has nothing but polar, nonpolar bonds, automatically you don't have to think about anything else. It is a nonpolar species. Okay. Now, uh, 
phosphorus and chlorides also have apolar bonds. And furthermore, they, it has a lone pair. If you go through the, the exercise of drawing the Lewis dot structure, you're going to find a lone pair on the phosphorus, okay? Which causes that bond angle to decrease, which causes the, the uh, dipole of these bonds to go in opposite directions, okay? When it is in tetrahedral position, like the CH3, when anything's in tetrahedral, if you have, for example, carbon tetrachloride, here's, here's an example. When you have uh, a molecule in, that is tetrahedral and all of them are bonded to the same type of different element, in this case, I got chlorides all the way around, okay? I have a dipole and four of them. But in tetrahedral configuration, they, they are such, the geometry is such that, that those dipoles cancel each other out, okay? So this guy would be a nonpolar species, even though they have four polar bonds, the fact that they cancel each other out because of the configuration tetrahedral, they are, it is nonpolar. Now, if I take, this one, methane, I, I substitute one of the hydrogens with the chloride, guess what? I got a polar species. Because even though I got three nonpolar bonds, right here, right here, right here, I got one polar bond, carbon chloride bond. And therefore, overall, the molecule is polar, okay? Until such time, I replace those hydrogens with four chlorides, and then I go back to nonpolar because when I'm over here, the polar bonds cancel out. Okay, and we talked about carbon dioxide, even though having polar bonds, they're equal, but in opposite, you go in the opposite direction and therefore cancel out. The molecule overall is, is uh, nonpolar. So if I were to use that information, I can now make a prediction and say that methane CH4 and carbon dioxide do are nonpolar and therefore would excuse me would exhibit very low solubility in water. Now if that was the case if carbon dioxide was was soluble in water Quite frankly, in soda pop, you wouldn't have that fizz because what's happening is, you know, it bubbled with carbon dioxide and yes, it goes in solution, but it doesn't go, it's not dissolved in the water. It's kind of hanging out in the, wa in the water molecules, kind of stabilize it. You take a soda bottle and you shake it. What happens? It fizzes up because that carbon dioxide is coming out, right? If it were truly soluble, you could shake it all day and no carbon dioxide would be coming out, but at the same time, you wouldn't have the fizz of your soda drink. So met the first two that I circled would be show uh, low solubility, whereas the uh, PCL3 would show high solubility in aqueous systems, which again, the opposite, you can say the methane, the first the CH4 and the CO2, would exhibit more solubility in nonpolar solvents, more oil-like solvents because of the nature of the beast. Okay, polarity plays a big part. And the best analogy I can think of growing up with five sisters is the makeup. Uh, because, and correct me if I'm wrong, they may have new makeup stuff out there. I don't know, but back in the day, there was makeup that always ran, they rain, you cried, whatever, it starts to run, okay? Your, your tears are made up of aqueous systems. It's an aqueous, basically the bulk of it's water. And so it would dissolve your makeup and it would start to run, okay? So that suggested that 
that makeup was had more polar quantities, polar attributes, because it was, it was more soluble in water. Then there's stuff out there that I guess you could stand in front of a hurricane and that makeup stays. Okay, I, may, I might be exaggerating, but it requires, you know, some other nonpolar oil-like material to take off because that makeup exhibits nonpolar properties and therefore requires things like, I remember my sisters used to, it, it was like Halloween every night because their face was some white cream, uh, something noxema, if I recall, because that has a lot of oil base and help remove that makeup. So anyway, that's an analogy. You know, another one too, if you work on cars, soap and water are not gonna remove that stuff. You gotta use something to get a little oil base to get that grease off your hands. Again, dealings with solubility and polarity of the bonds. Okay, so uh, we talked it at length through this, uh, do the Lewis style structures of water and ammonia, we, we've done this already. All both of those molecules are polar. All right, with that being said, congratulations. I think we're at week six. Week six, yeah, okay. Chapter seven is complete. All right, any questions? Well, let me... Continue then. And this is a relatively short chapter. Got about 24 slides. Okay. Chapter eight. Chapter eight deals with nomenclature, basically how to name compounds. So you you'll be asked questions like, you know, we gotta figure out the formula, and from a formula, give us a name or given a name, give us the formula, okay? And we're gonna deal with that. Now, <clears throat> for simple uh, neutral atoms with no charges, you know, we know that sodium is sodium and neon is neon atom and so forth, okay? So get to know the names of the first 20 uh, elements, but also included in there are the following to start learning of which we have BA, which is a barium. Okay. We got CO, which is cobalt, iodine, copper, iron, PB is lead, HG is mercury, AG is silver. The two get mixed up. You know, think, think about that, right? AU is gold, which gets mixed up with silver as far as the symbol is concerned. So, and then we got zinc, stannous. This morning, when you brush your teeth, you're using the fluorinated toothpaste. Uh, you were probably uh, brushing with stannous fluoride, or it could have been potassium fluoride. But stannous, another name for S, and stannous is tin. So you can use either stannous or tin. Strontium. And we got nickel, bromine, chromium, manganese, and CD, which is uh, uh, cadmium. Okay. And then the first 20, we got hydrogen on top here. And then we got helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon, sodium, magnesium. Aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine. Notice I said chlorine, not chloride. You got argon, just like I said, fluorine, the element, chlorine and chlorine. And then we've got K for potassium and CA for calcium, okay? Then all in here are the other ones we talked about. Those are probably the most common ones we're gonna be working with. All right. Now, ionic compounds to rehash. Ionic compounds are these compounds that consist of a metal and a nonmetal. 
And again, uh, covalent to rehash your memory. That's a combination of nonmetals only, okay? AKA molecular compounds is another name used for them. And remember, in covalent bonds, we're going to have either uh, polar or nonpolar covalent bonds. Now, the elements that have specifically the metal, well, uh, the elements when they lose or gain electrons, uh, they have their specific charge. We talked at length about that. The nonmetals, remember this when it comes to nomenclature, the nonmetals, we change the name. The metals, that stays the same. Sodium is still sodium if it's the element or the ion, okay? We have to distinguish the two. We say sodium atom or sodium element versus the sodium ion, okay? That's how we distinguish it. Uh, as compared to the nonmetals that we actually take their name and take out, most of them has an I and E ending. We take that out and add IDE. So chlorine becomes chloride. Bromine becomes bromide. Nitrogen becomes nitride. Okay, so on and so forth. All right, here's calcium. Now we have a series of what we call polyatomic ions. Okay. They have their, their they, you gotta, they stay as a packet. They don't have their own fancy name. Like you wouldn't say, you know, tetra, oxygen, phosphorus, or anything like that. They have their own name that we call phosphate, OH. Let me, let me go to the periodic table. Okay. On the bottom left of the periodic table, right there, these are the most common, not by means all of them, but the ones for Chem 130 that we're going to utilize are uh, some of the polyatomic ions. And then note, some of those we have like two, uh, two, two examples. We have NO3 negative, which is called nitrate. And we have NO2, which is called nitrite. Now, now think about this for, for a minute here. And that's why uh, nomenclature is, is very crucial. Let's take the example of uh, the nitrogen. Okay, we, we have N, the element obviously is called nitrogen. Okay, when nitrogen being in group five becomes an ion, it picks up three electrons with a negative three charge. Well, that name becomes now nitride. Okay, now nitrogen can also combine with oxygen with three of them specifically, and, and create this polyatomic ion packet. And its name oops, is called nitrate. Okay. Notice the endings, ide, eight. Okay. There's two examples, at least the ones we're going to introduce in Chem 130. Here is the other one has one less oxygen than the nitrate, and that is called nitrite. Okay, be familiar with the difference. Nitrate, we're not talking about nitride. The IDE for all the nonmetals tells you it is the single element that has gained the electron. So oxygen became oxide, fluorine became fluoride, the single element, the single atom of whatever element this is. When you add the eight suffix and the it, and you got the ni whatever up front, then you have nitrogen and then you have oxygen bonded to it. For example, SO4, oh, let me, let me do this. Give you some more examples. We have S for sulfur, okay? When it gains two electrons, we call that the sulfide. Okay, but then we have uh, two different types of, of at least the ones we're gonna use here. 
of sulfur that have been bonded to oxygen and has a negative charge. And this is called sulfate. Okay, notice the, the similarity, ATE. And then there's also an example of the sulfur. Instead of four oxygens, there's three of them. And we call that sulfite. Okay, so we can combine these ions, be it the monoatomic ions or the polyatomic ions, with metal. So we could have potassium nitrate, potassium nitride, potassium nitrate, and potassium nitrite, or potassium uh, sulfide, or potassium sulfate, or sulfite. And any metal that we work with, we you already have. You can mix and match. You know, I just said potassium. It could be anything else. Could have been sodium. Could have been any of the metals. Okay, any of the metals. So this is what nomenclature is all about: trying to recognize the ite, the eight, <laughs> and the eyed, because you could be given in words what the name is, and with that information you convert that to a formula. Now, oxidation states, you, you'll see me, I've been talking about the charge, okay? And I'm gonna divert saying the charge, I'm gonna convert that to the term oxidation state. Because with respect to ionic compounds, there's no question about it, we have a charge. But when we talk about covalent compounds, we actually have a partial charge. It's not a full charge. And so to encompass the, the, the to, to get them together, I guess for lack of a better word, we use the term oxidation state. And it's just simply a fancy name for charge. So when I talk about what is the oxidation state of the sodium ion, well, what you do find out in the product table, see that is in group one, it becomes a plus one. Oxidation state of calcium, plus two. Oxidation state of oxide is a negative two, okay? All elements obviously have a zero charge because they have equal number of protons and electrons. And it is only when they either lose or gain electrons, they become ionic. Uh, some elements have a fixed charge and only one possibility. So. What is meant by that? Okay, others have a variable charge. Well, this is what is meant. I have changed my periodic table a little bit. You're welcome, obviously, to do the same to yours because I got I'm adding a little bit of information. Okay, if you notice the first two columns, group one and group 2A, okay, it would not hydrogen excluding hydrogen. The ones in group 1A, always will have a plus one charge, 100% of the time, okay? So you got one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, six, what am I doing? Six elements that when they become ions have always 100% of the time have a plus one charge, okay? Then you got six more ion elements in, in uh, group 2A that will at 100% of the time have a plus two charge. There are no examples to our knowledge that beryllium and will have a any charge other than the plus two. So you got there's 12 there, 12 elements. And then there are four that have a constant exact charge. Aluminum's right here, always has a plus three, hundred percent of the time. Zinc always has a plus two. Silver always has a plus one, and cadmium always has a plus two. One way, one way to find these is just make, make, make a little arrow, I guess, okay? Now, that means that you have 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 elements that you know 100, oh, I went over to that, 100% of the time is charged, okay? All the time. That means that everybody else over here can vary. We don't know what their charge is, but we can calculate it, okay? The, the ions, uh, specifically 
the ones I'm going to most of the time that we're working with, the non-metals, these guys always have a negative three, always have a negative two, always have a negative one, okay? Always 100% of the time. All right, we'll come back to this. I didn't realize I carried over a little bit. So let me, uh, we got chapter eight. And I think we only went four deep, four slides. 